Hey everyone, it's Hugh Sweeney here and I'm back tonight with a video about the GH5. I've been using this camera for close to a year and a half, but it's two years almost since the GH5 was announced. And the camera was released in about March uh, 2017, so that's not far off two years. But as I said, I've been using it for about a year and a half and it completely changed the whole way that I work in terms of videography and filmmaking. You know, years ago when I would arrive on a job, I would have my big camera, my big Blackmagic camera with me. And I used to have a rig attached to them with a battery pack and a focus puller loaded up as well on a big sort of spreader tripod. And if I wanted to do dolly shots, I had to put two big pipes on the ground and lift a dolly onto it and all that stuff. I said, I gotta get myself a smaller camera. And when the GH5 was released, with the image stabilization, the fact that it had huge frame rate recording capabilities, 180 frames per second, that wasn't cropped, decent recording formats, 4K at 60 frames per second, it could output 4K 10-bit at 60 frames per second through the likes of the Atomos Ninjas. So I was really drawn to this camera. So I decided to get the GH5. So first up, I was doing some work around Galway City here and uh, straight away, you know, I had the camera on the tripod and then I just took it off the tripod and started shooting it handheld. It was so light and so fast. Thanks to image stabilization, I was finally able to get really good handheld shots, but I had to get used to it. I was looking at a much smaller screen than on the Blackmagic cameras, and I was sort of going and running it a little bit more, so a lot of stuff was out of focus. But after a while, I started to really, um, really get more comfortable with the camera and really enjoy using it. Because of the stabilization on the sensor, I found myself doing a lot of handheld work. So many shots that I've, sh I've done handheld actually look like dolly shots because of the image stabilization. And when you're shooting at 60 frames per second and you're playing back at 24, it's gonna be nice slow motion. And when you're not using a tripod and you're shooting gun and run style, it gives you so many opportunities to get so many more shots so much quicker. And I just, I have such a minimal lightweight setup. It's absolutely fantastic. And that's one of the, the strong points about the camera. Lightweight, minimal setup so easy to use out of the box without the need for rigging it up. When you shoot on a camera like this in public spaces, people don't think you're actually doing video, they think you're a photographer. And that actually makes things a little bit easier. And you're less intrusive, you're less noticeable. And that is another reason that I just love using the GH5 and I love using it without a rig. I use the Sigma 18 to 35 a lot on this camera with the speed booster and that sort of wide, semi-wide to mid-range lens was very good. I'm the number one fanboy of the 18 to 35 Sigma, but I actually recently sold it uh, to get the Sigma 28 to 70. And that was a really good idea because the 28 to 70, even though it's not as bright a lens as the 1.8 Sigma 18 to 35, it's actually so much more versatile. Plus I have the speed booster here, the XL speed booster. This will let you crop down 2.64 the XL speed booster. This was designed originally for the GH4. So it crops it down a little bit more. It makes it a little bit brighter. 2.8 lenses come out as a two lens, an F2 lens. And it basically means that you have a crop factor of 1.28 as opposed to 
2x, which if you use a native lens. In other words, it's exactly halfway between a full frame camera and an APS-C sensor crop camera. So it's actually relatively wide and good for depth of field. Getting used to the menu originally of the GH5 was a bit of a learning curve coming from Blackmagic cameras. There is so many features on the GH5. Everything from like 6K burst mode to, you know, sensor cropping. You know, obviously the stabilization can be switched on and off. You have e-stabilization, you have all these different features. And then you have photography features as well. With a camera like this, um, you know, you really got to learn it and sit down and go through the menus. And uh, that's kind of what I did. I've never spent as long learning a camera as I have with this GH5. Another thing I love about the GH5 since I got it is the customizability of everything. It's laden with all those little buttons that you can set to your liking and fully customize. And um, I recently learned a little trick where you literally just hold down the button and it will let you customize it. And that's just so quick. I didn't know that. And I learned that from Photo Joseph. Check out his YouTube channel here because he's got amazing videos about the GH5 and all its functions. It is so customizable, it's brilliant. One of the downsides of the GH5 for me was coming from the Blackmagic cameras, which are known to be really good filmic cameras, uh, to a GH5, which is gonna look a bit more video-ish. It was a bit of a step down and I did notice it but you really gotta, you gotta think about what you're doing. You gotta think of the output of your work. And most of my output is, you know, like client work for companies and also my own YouTube videos here, maybe vlogs and stuff. And you don't need, you know, you don't need the most amazing filmic quality. And if you do good color grading on this and you bang a lot on it or whatever, you can get amazing results. And I recently shot a film on this and everybody was asking me how I got such good quality. So yes, a little bit less filmic. The GH5S is a bit more filmic. I recently saw comparisons between the GH5S and the Blackmagic production camera, and it was very difficult to tell the difference. The low light capabilities of the GH5 have been surprisingly good. I thought I was gonna be really stuck doing low light jobs, and um, it was surprisingly good. But having said that, I used the Sigma 18 to 35 with the speed booster. So that actually went down as far as F1.2 in terms of the f-stop within the camera, as in it told me it was at F1.2. So that is, that is pretty bright, but um, recording in fairly decent formats and stuff where you're not um, doing too high a frame rate, I found that the uh, quality of the GH5 that I could get for relatively low light was actually quite acceptable. Uh, I, used to, I didn't go much further than ISO 800, rarely went over 1600, and the results I got were pretty good. So image quality, um, low light, not bad. So initially the camera, I was kind of using it out of the box with the factory default settings, and it was working out pretty good. But after a few sessions of using it, I started to explore the settings in the camera. And I did something uh, unknown to me at the time that later on I would really learn to regret and that was make some adjustments to the highlights and shadows. And I didn't know it at the time, but I basically had rewritten a lot of my custom settings to include this raised shadow feature, like a reverse S-curve on the shadows, and it completely started to destroy my work. And I was wondering what was going on. I thought the camera was broken. I also noticed this pink and green banding, total degeneration of the image. And all that was because I had set the shadows to be, uh, to be raised in a reverse curve. Now, I didn't figure that out until I went onto the Panasonic group and explained my situation. And those guys on there, much praise to them. They figured it out for me. So problem solved. If you are going into your settings in the camera, stay away from that raised shadow settings. Just leave the settings as they are. Don't try and raise those shadows too much because it's going to really destroy your image. When it came to picture profiles, on many occasions I considered buying the Vlog, but I never did. I used Cine D a little bit, but I found myself opting to use Cine V in most cases. I found that a simple curve-based color correction in Resolve with a LUT at about half power gave me the look that I wanted. The colors are pretty natural and it only takes one or two little tweaks, so you don't spend that long grading the image. 
Since day one using the GH5, I never used autofocus on this camera, not once, not a single time. With the ADD, you could just point to different locations and do these lovely little focus transitions and I was hoping that I would be able to do it with the GH5. I didn't even mind if it wouldn't let me, you know, um, autofocus on subjects, but I, I thought it would let me autofocus exactly uh, touching the screen for like focus pulls and even just getting perfect focus by touching the screen. I thought it was gonna do that, but it actually didn't. There was a lot of shifting to get the focus right. Whereas on the 80D, you press it and it just eases in perfectly to that focus point. Meaning that on the 80D, you could record your focus movements all the time with beautiful smoothness and 100% accuracy. So coming from the 80D to the, the GH5 was a big downer in terms of focus, but, Every cloud has its silver lining and when I was using the uh, GH5, I noticed that my skill set in terms of focus pulling and just actually getting stuff in focus, I saw it going up and up and up. And the last year and a half, because I haven't been able to rely on autofocus, it's actually made me into a better cameraman. Uh, if I was using my autofocus all the time, I wouldn't have learned a thing, but now I've learned a lot of little tricks with focus. Plus, of course, I use the Atomos Ninja in a lot of cases with the GH5 where I had a nice big screen I could look at and get a focus from that as well, which helped me. There's so many more upsides to the GH5, such as the flippy screen. I know like years ago, video cameras always had flippy screens. I don't know why it's such a big deal today. Just a pity that it wasn't reliable for autofocus uh, as much as like the Canons because if it was a good autofocus camera, it would be like the number one vlogging camera. But yeah, the flippy screen on this has been absolutely fantastic. You know, it's been so good on gimbals as well. Such a small package that I used it a lot on gimbal shots. I did have the Giantech, if that's the right pronunciation, initially, and now I've moved on to the Ronin, and it's just the perfect camera with gimbal shots. Uh, you can set the gimbal up and you can also set the camera to have stabilization, but uh, I left the in-body stabilization off most, most of the time I was using the gimbal and just let the gimbal do the work. In terms of photography, um, because I had the Canon 80D up until recently for the last two and a half years, and now I have this camera, the EOS R, it just sort of doesn't make sense for me to use it for photography and I haven't really used it for photography to be honest that much. I have used it enough to, to get a feel for it and I gotta say it's, it's, it's a great little photography camera. Probably a few less million pixels. I mean it's got 20 million pixels as opposed to 30 million on the EOS R so I'm gonna probably gravitate towards the EOS R but at the same time I would like to try things like the burst mode for bird photography. You know try and get some birds catching something or landing and stuff. 6K burst mode at 30 frames per second. The EOS R is actually quite weak at that style of photography. So I am actually interested in trying this out for some wildlife photography. The few images that I did take, particularly with this lens, uh, this is the Samyang 12mm lens, native lens. And I got this lens for vlogging and I took a couple of night images and stuff with this and they were as sharp as a tack. They were so sharp, so um, beautiful little sharp images uh, out of this camera. So the future of MFT uh, cameras is under question at the moment. I've seen some people doing reviews and stuff and videos about MFT, what's happening, and I can understand that, but like one, one thing that really pisses me off about MFT is that the, the whole system was designed to be small and compact and uh, the lenses have so much less glass in them than other lenses. I mean, look at this lens, for example. This is the Sigma 50 to 100, okay, this lens. And uh, this is an APS-C, this isn't even a full frame lens. And it's massive and it weighs an absolute ton, but it's a really big lump of glass. And um, it's priced at a certain price range but the MFT lenses are like a fraction of the size, but they're still really expensive, even though they've way less glass. Maybe the production of them is a little bit more, I don't know, finer because of the glass is smaller and stuff. But as Tony Northrup says, there is no substitute for a big lump of glass. And I like using big lenses for some bizarre reason. And I have the speed booster. So I think MFT, it's probably gonna stick around. I mean, it's, it's hard to know. What are the advantages of MFT? 
there is a move towards full frame again and Panasonic are supposed to be releasing full frame video forward slash photography cameras. I believe it's called the S1. Can you imagine a camera from Panasonic if they can do this with the GH5, uh, what they're gonna do with the full frame sensor and image stabilization and photography capabilities. I'm sure it's gonna be a hugely desirable camera. Of course, there's all the alternatives, the Sonys. I mean, some people love the Sonys. Um, if you have Canon glass, you can adapt it to the Sonys. You're gonna get similar results to the GH5, I'm sure, if not better in some scenarios. I think the GH5 might be a better camera in other scenarios. The image stabilization might be slightly better in the GH5, but of course the Sony has better autofocus. The Blackmagic have a new camera called a pocket camera. I think it's a different type of camera to the GH5. I think if you're shooting short films, particularly uh, fictional stuff, are documentaries where you're setting up shots as opposed to gun and run stuff. I think the Blackmagic pocket camera is going to upstage this in terms of uh, you know cinematic imagery, color grading, and of course um, just color science. The Blackmagic pocket camera has a more powerful image, but all around this camera is going to beat the shit out of the Blackmagic pocket camera in terms of all around capabilities, it's gonna be a much better camera. In terms of photography, if you want a really good photography camera and you wanna be able to do video as well, I think the Canon EOS R would probably be a better choice, especially if you've got Canon glass on the EOS R, they adapt beautifully. If you're one of these videographers who does a lot of tripod stuff like what I'm doing now, a piece to camera, if you're a YouTuber that does a lot of product stuff where you're lifting up stuff, holding it to camera like the way I just lifted this lens up, then I think the Canon uh, EOS R, which I'm filming this on, would be a better choice than the GH5. So highly recommended, I love this camera, go and buy it. And more importantly, go and subscribe to my channel here and watch my videos if you can. I've got new videos coming up about camera gear and the likes as well. And I wanna start doing tutorials as well quite soon on this channel. Uh, check me out on Instagram as well, I'm on there, and on Facebook as well, where you'll see some more of my uh, personal stuff. So thank you so much for watching. A thumbs up would be great, a subscribe would be great. Until next time, until next video, it is bye from me. See ya.